Hi, everyone. Uh, Dr. Phil, it is uh, Thursday, June 6, 2024, <clears throat> for posterity's sake. Uh, I just want to do, do another quick video on Chapter 4 before I start making the exa <clears throat> exam for Summer 1. I'm hoping this will all work. Well, I'm able to share the screen, but I'm not figuring out how to. Okay. <clears throat> So I wanted to go over basically digestion with you, go over some of the cells in your body, <clears throat> go over peristalsis, the liver, stomach, um, some of the reflexes and the basic process behind digestion. So it really is more than just <clears throat> eating your food and going to the bathroom. So you know, we talk a little bit about breaking your food down into different components and then rebuilding it back up using the liver as our processing plant. So please realize your body has 100 trillion cells. I wanna get into the microbiome here in a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, which is in your intestines. And please realize the microbiome outnumbers your cells by 100 to one. And your microbiome is really what's in your intestine, which helps break down food. And there's studies showing that it actually is responsible for your immune function, uh, helping your immune function, your emotions, your thoughts, um, your metabolism really um, has to do with your own body, your genetics, but your microbiome also helps regulate that. All of your cells are specialized. So whether it's blood cells, um, blood plasma, muscle cells, uh, smooth muscle for your intestines, or uh, in your stomach, which are in three different directions. So when you swallow in your bolus from your throat, it goes in your stomach and your stomach pulverizes it in three different directions. Those muscles are oriented and <clears throat> to do that. Then it goes um, through the a sphincter into your duodenum, then in your small intestines, your large intestines to reabsorb the water, and then into your rectum until it's socially acceptable to defecate. So we'll go over some of the basic tissues. Please realize tissues are two or more cells, and then two or more tissues um, develop into organs. And then the organ system we'll be kind of talking about today will be digestive system, and then you being the whole organism. So really just um, on the exam, I'll make three or four questions about organ systems, organ tissues, or cells. So it'll say a cell is, or tissues are, organs are comprised of, organ systems are comprised of, organism is comprised of, just so you have a basic idea of what that is. <clears throat> so once again, cells are, um, Unicellular, when we're talking about this, so muscle cells here, these are smooth muscles and they're tapered. All right, so these are um, involuntary, which means luckily we don't have to think about it. And they're tapered. The nucleus is generally always in the center. All right, and then if we have two or more cells together, that's a tissue. All right, and then we'll get into an organ would be two or more tissue. So please realize your stomach has a lining. It has um, mucin cells, or mu yeah, mucin cells, or goblet cells that make mucin, and that turns into mucus. Then you have cells um, that produce hydrochloric acid to help you digest. We have uh, cells of the pyloric sphincter to regulate food coming in and out of the stomach. All right, and then you have different muscle tissues to churn that up. Then your organ system would be a little bit what we're gonna talk about today. So going from your mouth, pharynx, through your diaphragm into your stomach, then your duodenum, <clears throat> small intestine, jejunum, ileum, um, and then the large intestine. And then you have your organism. So whether we're talking about you know, basically any mammal or even reptiles, or amphibians, they all have digestive systems and they comprise the organism. All right, so here's just a basic from your book, good Lord, <clears throat> chapter four, the organ systems of the body. We're going to really just today talk a little bit um, about paracelsis, the small intestines, and break down the organs uh, individual a little bit. So 
sorry, this is, <clears throat> I have a video embedded in here. So when you go to download the PowerPoint, make sure that you uh, hit enable, it'll play the video for you. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so you can watch that video on your own. It's about five minutes long. I've got about five embedded in here. You don't have to watch them, but it gives you a nice little break and it'll uh, go over things with a little bit of a visual component. So hopefully it'll help you learn it or memorize it. All right, so digestion really is um, humans are basically omnivores, all right? Some people are vegan, some people, um, you know, it depends um, on your your beliefs or what you choose, but generally humans are omnivores, all right? So digestion is mechanical. And the mechanical portion of that is initial when you're chewing up your food, mastication with your teeth. And, you know, we're not really gonna get into the teeth, different, the molars and incisors, the tear and bicuspids, things like that, but please realize we have to chew your food up into smaller pieces so we can swallow them and you don't choke. Then we have to regulate the whole uh, swallowing process so we don't have things going up into your nasal cavity. And when you go to swallow, your epiglottis has to close so we don't inhale things into our respiratory system. I'm sure we've all done that with uh, soda or milk or water or something where you laugh or sneeze or while you're eating and then it can be problematic. And hopefully you'll, if you uh, inhale something, you'll be coughing it up, get it out of your respiratory system so it doesn't cause a problem. And the chemical portion, please realize, is once the food, well, technically in your stomach, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in your mouth, you have um, cellular amylase that can start breaking down some starches into sugar. Basically, once it gets to your stomach, we have hydrochloric acid, will help the acid will start cleaving bonds and start breaking that down. And then we go, food goes into the duodenum, DM, depending on how you want to pronounce it, after the stomach. And that means 12 fingers, that's the length of it. And that's really where all of the chemical digestion technically starts, where your, the different foods, whether it's protein, fats, um, sugars, you know, fats will enable um, bile to be released from the gallbladder, which was produced in the liver. And then the pancreas will release different enzymes to help break down lipids or fats in different uh, proteins. So we'll have different um, kinases that will start breaking down food into smaller and smaller particles. We really wanna break that food down into smaller particles. So in the digestive system, it's absorbed into the microvilli, it goes into your capillary beds, then it goes to the portal, peptic portal, vein to your liver. Your liver will detoxify any uh, poisons, alcohols, medication, and it also will start taking those amino acids and reprocessing and reassembling them into whatever proteins you need, whether it's an enzyme or for repair. And it also will help some of that, the liver will store glycogen to help regulate your glucose sugar levels along with your pancreas. So if they ever ask you, your pancreas is digestive and endocrine. It will has digestive enzymes, but also has alpha and beta cells, which can start regulating your blood sugar. There's a lot of um, <clears throat> science right now about insulin spikes and regulating your insulin and obesity. Um, you know, I'll try to get into that uh, in the middle of the course when we start getting into carbohydrates, but, um, you know, I could turn this into a two semester course if I wanted to, but just go with the basics right now. And then please realize once we digest the food, we have to be able to absorb it. So I have a video up on the microvilli, which is the intestinal wall and ha has finger like projections or villi that increase the surface. Um, area so you can absorb the food. So it doesn't really make a difference if you can break all this down. If it can't be absorbed and go into the capillary beds, it'll pass right through. So people that have digestive IBS or Crohn's disease or um, 
posted a video on glycosamate and Roundup and how that can really destroy the tight junctions and destroy your microvilli, really starts destroying the surface area of your small intestine. So even if you ate the most nutritious food out there, you wouldn't be able to absorb it. And that's where we can start getting into some nutrient deficient diseases, or if you have leaky gut, um, we can get some of those toxins or chemical pesticides or poisons in the food supply into your bloodstream, and that could start causing havoc with your liver and cause uh, a multitude of different diseases and syndromes. So uh, oh, let's try that. <clears throat> that should, <clears throat> sorry. Are right, your digestive tract, and please realize I want to point out your digestive tract goes from your mouth, your anus, and it is literally outside your body. I know that everyone thinks it's inside your body, but it actually is on the exterior. So anything that you're consuming, any air, water, or food is on the outside of your body. It has to be able to be brought into your body. And we have a lot of mechanisms to make sure that only what we want is brought in. Once again, I'm going to reiterate, if you destroy your microvilli or you destroy those tight junctions, your digestive tract, things can get into your body that shouldn't be. They kind of bypass the barrier and that can cause a lot of problems. Right? So the major organs, when we think about the digestive system are the mouth, the esophagus is after the mouth that goes through your diaphragm into your stomach. Stomach, everyone is relatively familiar with. Please realize that your stomach is on the left side of your body, 95% of the population, right under your diaphragm, under your left lung, next to your spleen. And then we have the small intestine where the majority of your chemical process happens in the breakdown. The large intestine, really with your video, is there to extract any extra fluid um, of the ascending tract transverse tract and descending tract. And then we have the rectum, which is a storage area for defecation of the feces when it's um, socially acceptable to do so. Now accessory organs are not the major organs, but they do uh, help with digestion. So teeth are uh, important. You can live without them, but they do help with speaking phonation and breaking down food. Your tongue, you have to have your tongue intact to be able to swallow things in a regulated manner. And swallowing is actually a very complex process. Your salivary glands in your mouth, you have to be able to release um, saliva to mix with the food to swallow it. And the chemical breakdown happens there. And without saliva, you wouldn't be able to really taste food. And you also have to have um, cranial nerve one Smell is actually associated with taste too. They're all interrelated, but beyond the scope of the course. Your liver has over 500 functions. So for right now, uh, liver is gonna be where the majority of your nutrients go after they get into the small intestines. They go into the capillary bed, into the port, port system, they go to your liver. Your liver will detoxify things, break them down further, and then rebuild them up. And the gallbladder is basically only a storage space for bile. Bile is um, a product of your liver. It helps with, it doesn't really digest fats. It helps emulsify them or break them down into smaller particles so they can be broken down easier. So in some books or some people will say your bile uh, digests fat. It really doesn't. It just kind of breaks it down. Right. And bile also, if you take microbiology, it, it helps inhibit a lot of gram-positive bacteria. So your gut should have only enteric gram-negative bacteria in it for the most part. And your pancreas, as I said, is going to be, for this chapter, a major digestive organ for enzymes that get released the minute food leaves your stomach into the, to the sphincter of OD into your duodenum for digestion, but please realize, you're getting the carbohydrates, we're gonna realize that your pancreas also helps regulate your blood sugar um, through insulin and glucagon, right? 
and alpha and beta cells. We'll talk a little bit, hopefully, about diabetes of type 1 uh, and type 2. Right. So there's a breakdown of your digestive tract. And once again, please realize it is an open tube all the way, all the way through here, <clears throat> all the way over and out. Open tube, it's literally outside of your body. I want my key bag. So, <clears throat> so digestion, once again, teeth and chewing, you have to have saliva and some enzymes. Amylase is one that'll help break down um, starch into sugars. And if you don't believe me, take a saltine cracker or cracker and just keep chewing it over and over again without swallowing it. And you'll realize it'll turn sweet as those enzymes break that starch into sugar. Your tongue, you have your taste buds for sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, umami, which is that beef or savory flavor, which was really, I think, discovered in the 70s, relatively new, and then smell. And if you don't believe me, please think about the last time you had a uh, upper respiratory infection or a cold and how things smelled differently and things tasted differently. There's a video on swallowing. <clears throat> so it's a very complex process. And once again, just sort of know the, the process. So as the food comes through, we have to make sure it doesn't go up into the nasal pharynx. We have to have something lift here. And then when you swallow, the epiglottis closes this opening so that air and food doesn't go in through your mouth. So this is a shared airway here where the pointer is for food and Air. Sorry. <clears throat> There's your epiglottis. Epi means on. Glottis means tongue, more or less. <clears throat> so we have swallowing through peristalsis. There's a video coming up on peristalsis. So that really is, <clears throat> these will contract and these will contract, will propels the food forward only. If you have retro peristalsis or backwards, that's not good. Things are going backwards in the digestive system. That can happen with the um, intestinal block. All right, so not, not a pleasant thing. It's a survival thing. Right, choking, so signs of choking are the Heimlich maneuver. <clears throat> so legally, I don't know if we can call it the Heimlich maneuver anymore because it was named after the person who did it. So um, there is the Heimlich maneuver. Everyone should, hopefully be familiar with that. It's better to have someone there to thrust into your stomach up into your rib cage. And what you're doing is you're really forcing any air that's in your lungs up through, and you're gonna dislodge that piece of food like a plunger. You have a blocked up toilet or whatever. And if you don't have anyone near you, you can make it survival to finish, right? You're gonna ram yourself on the chair, forcing uh, something into the diaphragm, expelling that air as fast as you can. Sort of like a cough, forced cough. All right. <clears throat> so your lower gastroesophageal sphincter, and once again, I said your esophagus right here, your diaphragm is over here, which is the muscle that controls your breathing and holds down to <clears throat> increase the um, volume of your lungs. Decrease the pressure so air comes in. When the diaphragm relaxes, it's dome shaped. It makes the area of your lungs smaller, increases the pressure so air is forced out. That's really how you um, breathe. But once again, this goes through the diaphragm. And if you ever heard of a hiatal hernia or any kind of a uh, bariatric hernia, sometimes the stomach, the upper part of it, can come up through the diaphragm. It doesn't really close all the way, or if you overeat, um, or if you have really poor eating habits, barrier esophagus, where the um, hydrochloric acid and enzymes get expelled up into here, they start eroding the esophagus, so that's not good either. So we have gastric juices, which is hydrochloric uh, acid and enzymes, and this really helps break down food 
And it also starts killing some of the microbes. So it's actually it helps you with uh, the immune function more or less. Mucus is the same thing that's in your nose, in your back of your throat. That coats your stomach so the hydrochloric acid doesn't start dissolving in your stomach muscles. And once again, if you look here, these are rude or um, holes in your stomach. So when your stomach gets full, they allows them to expand. And once again, I said your, your stomach has muscles in three different orientations. So as those contract, they start churning that food up, mixing it all up, getting it coated with these hydrochloric acid and enzymes. Time is literally, time is literally, when you swallow the food through mastication, it goes in your stomach, that bolus turns into chyme. So it's kind of a pasty type substance. And that goes through the um, pyloric sphincter and the duodenum about a tablespoon at a time. If we have more than that, we get into um, a lot of problems with oncotic pressure. It's called gastric dumping. It can cause major, major problems. Uh, your digestive has to changes the osmolarity and, and start causing all kinds of, I won't get into it, but it's not a good thing. And then we have a small intestine, the duodenum. Once again, is this little portion here, the first, it means 12 fingers, the first area where your gallbladders Gallbladder's up here, your pancreas is over here. And this is where a lot of these things get dumped in to mix with that chyme. This is where the chemical processes start. <clears throat> your jejunum is the first portion of your small intestine. Then the uh, ileum is the last portion of your small intestine. Then we have the ileocecal valve here where we go from small intestine to large intestine. <clears throat> but if you're ever asked, or if you want to think about it, most of your chemical digestion and absorption happens in the jejunum, right? And this is really, really long and convoluted and twisted. We really want to want to increase that transit time, and we'll see later. These the circumference of these is uh, all microvilli. And that's to increase surface area, so we can actually, as the chyme goes through the fingers of the intestines, we have a lot of area to absorb. The nutrients through the microvilli and into the capillary beds. So villi are like little finger-like, hair-like projections, and we have a capillary network. And we have lacteals, and they really will help absorb tiny, tiny, tiny micro pieces of uh, fat. But generally, larger pieces of fat don't dissolve in water, so they really can't go into the capillary bed. That's where we have to have your cholesterol or HDL or LDL. We have to really coat that fat with some protein to float it around in your capillary bed so we can get it to the areas of the body we need to. And then we have absorbed cells. So we have the chemical breakdown without cells to absorb it and get into the bloodstream. It doesn't really do us any good. <clears throat> so here are, this is the inside of your intestine, food is the, the wall, and this is the villus or those micro villi. And once again, these are really going to help increase the surface area of your intestinal cells, micro villi. Nutrients go in here, through here, and into your capillary bed. If you take microbiology with me, we'll go into some of the um, Cholera, salmonella, shigella, some of these things that really can start um, causing these cells to secrete things we don't want them to or they can get into your body. But, but right now, let's just hit it at that. <clears throat> Here's a video on peristalsis. So please watch that. It'll show you how things move. So please watch that. I'll help explain a lot of this. All right. All right. And please realize here, um, as food goes through your stomach and your small intestines, 
what the chemical breakdown is and the absorption, we're gonna absorb this into your, your veins, the portal vein, and realize this goes to your liver. A lot of people think it, you just digest things and it goes right to your cells. Not really, it has to go to your liver for detoxification. Is any anything you swallowed that was poisonous, bacteria, um, parasites, alcohol, medications, your liver has to detoxify it and it takes all those nutrients and either breaks them down further or reassembles them to something that you need. And so your liver has many functions. There's literally 500 that we know of. There's probably more that we don't know about. So it's a very important organ. So please take care of your liver. It can regenerate to a certain, there's a limitation of matter. It can't uh, regenerate after about 70% damage. Um, if you don't believe me, ask an alcoholic and they'll tell you. Uh, once you destroy it, um, sometimes it can't come back. Other than a liver transplant, which always don't don't always take. <clears throat> so it monitors the blood's nutrient contents. And so your liver also can kind of tell what you need, and it can signal your hypothalamus, your brain, to to um, eat things, or it can tell you whether you're thirsty or hungry. That kind of your hypothalamus monitors your your blood levels. <clears throat> your blood brain barrier. Um, but in this case, just realize it detoxifies many harmful substances. So anything that you're taking in and acetaminophen, aspirin, alcohol, um, any drugs at all, any pharmaceuticals, your liver has to detoxify it. Your liver can make glucose and it can store things like glycogen, which is a, a very condensed form of glucose if you're in a fasting state. It stores various nutrients, fat soluble and water soluble. So water soluble nutrients are what it sounds like. They're soluble in water. The issue is they will be excreted with urine. So they're excreted two or three times a day or four or more or however many times you urinate a day. Water insoluble nutrients like chiromicrons, like your LDL, which we have to said before, we have to chylomicrons, we have to coat fat with protein so they can float around in the blood because they're not soluble. Fat's not soluble in fluid. And lymphatic system is there to drain any extra fluid in your body that doesn't get back into your capillary beds. And it also is plays a major role in fat absorption and another major role Anatomy for micro or anatomy physiology, it plays a major role in your immune system. And <clears throat> by the way, before I forget, uh, believe it or not, 60 to 70% of your immune system is in your digestive tract. So think about that through Pyre's patches. All right, then look, so there's some of the other accessory organs. So please realize liver, um, gallbladder for storage of bile. Pancreas, once again, for digestive enzymes and sugar regulation or glucose regulation, actually. There's a video on the portal venous system and liver functions. Don't worry about the details. Towards the middle of the video, it'll kind of explain how things go from the digestive system into your liver. All right, but please just have a, an idea of how that works. Um, I'm hoping that all of you are taking this course so you can really learn about nutrition and how to eat healthier, but it'd be kind of nice if we figured we knew exactly how your digestive system worked. A little bit more in depth than elementary or high school. So here it says your pancreas. Please realize there's your stomach, there's your duodenum, pancreas, there's your gallbladder. So this area of your small intestines, the duodenum is really where we start dumping all of the uh, enzymes and and the bile into the first portion of the small intestine because the chyme just came out of here through pyloric sphincter, about a tablespoon at a time. And we're gonna hit it with enzymes. And we can turn it around so we can have increased the surface area so we can start breaking it down. Your large intestine, please realize your small intestine was here, jejunum, ileum, ileocecal valve. All right, your appendix is right here, by the way, just so you know. So everything is 
pretty much been digested, absorbed through chemical processes that are hopefully absorbed into the villi, the liver to get processed. This is where we start getting rid of any fecal matter, anything that isn't digested. And please realize this is a full of bacteria too. And please don't think that all bacteria are bad. You need bacteria or you wouldn't be able to break down your food. So as we ascend the ascending colon, we're gonna start pulling any extra water out because in the small intestine, it's very, very aqueous, very sloshy, right? This is the transverse colon. Descending colon, we take all the water out. And this is the rectum where we store, and there's two sphincters in here, internal and external sphincter. All right, this kind of tells your brain whether you have to go to the bathroom or not. And please realize too, when we get into vitamins, vitamin K is produced in your large intestine and you need that for blood clotting. Should be another video coming up. Yep. <clears throat> Showing you how peristalsis. <clears throat> Here's peristalsis. I'll just show you that real quick. It's like 30 seconds, but this is really how you're fascinating. How you're when you hear your stomach churning and you can feel the food moving in your intestines. That's peristalsis. These are closing and we're contracting, we're moving that food in a one way direction. There goes Mr. Hankey. Um, right there. <clears throat> All right, so please realize you have intestinal bacteria and microbiome. So once again, please don't think bacteria is bad. Actually, you need it. The majority of your bacteria, if well, good bacteria in your digestive system are help regulate everything going on in your body. Uh, please, if you have few minutes or you want to really learn something about your health, learn about the microbiome. It's ex extremely essential. It's a really hot topic in the past 10 or 15 years. Hopefully um, they'll start teaching this or at least discussing it in elementary school and high school, but we're going to discuss it now. And then you need your good bacteria. So without your good bacteria, if you take a bunch of antibiotics and you wipe out all of your Bacteria in your body and your small intestine. Uh, the only that's left is your, I think in the details, but spore formers or Clostridium difficile. And you can have some major, major um, issues with that. And a lot of antibiotics will not kill C. diff. So please keep your uh, natural microbiome healthy. And there are studies where we've taken microbiome from one person into another, and that person will start taking on characteristics of the person that we transplanted the uh, microbiome from. So it's not just um, fake science. There is some research behind it. So antibiotics can wipe out your microbiome. And please realize, uh, when we get into food safety, a lot of your food has antibiotics in it because these animals are living in conditions which might be disease causing. So the majority of the antibiotics in the United States right now are actually used for, and the food processing industry, which is astounding for me. Probiotics are foods you can eat to help your bacteria and help um, with bacteria grow. And please realize there's some bacteria that live on the fiber you need fiber in your diet to help things move through peristalsis. It actually stretches your intestines, makes you feel fuller. Uh, it'll help you not get um, polyps and all kinds of digestive issues. So please um, start thinking about ways to incorporate more fiber in your diet. Because right now the food supply in the US is stripped of all fiber. You know, refined foods are meant to be stored and shipped all over the world. Probably not the healthiest thing, but I won't um, digress into that. Or I will, but I'll try not to keep reel it in. All right, intestinal infections. You yeah. can have some starvation, antibiotics, and emotional stress. Because you realize emotional stress can cause uh, increased transit time in your intestines. It can cause um, decreased transit time and cause it to be uh, paralyzed. 
it can cause increase in hydrochloric acid, which will make your intestinal content acidic. Uh, you know, your duodenum and pancreas can secrete a bunch of bicarbonate to change that pH from your stomach into something a little bit more neutral, but your um, emotional stress can really affect that. Um, starvation here is um, starving because uh, you don't have food, which is different than fasting, which they're doing a lot of studies on fasting and how that's actually very healthy for you, whether we're talking about um, intermittent fasting or fasting for a day, two days, three days, a week. There's a little video on your microbiome. So I wanted to start studying this in chunk. into some of these disorders. <clears throat> All right, constipation and frequency. So constipation, you really need more dietary fiber, a lot of water intake. So I tell my patients um, a quart of water, quarter liter per day for every 50 pounds of body weight. So all of us should be drinking at least three liters of water a day, right? And um, some of these things that people drink don't really count because a lot of them are diuretics, force water out. So um, water, um, coffee sort of counts, but some people say it's a diuretic. Um, exercise can help. So please get some kind of exercise, whether it's walking or not taking the elevator, um, using stairs or not parking right next to where you're going and actually walk somewhere. Any changes in your routine. So if anyone travels, abrupt change in your routine can cause constipation because your body doesn't know exactly what's going on. So it's in a, um, not it's in fight or flight. It's not in rest and digest. So you have a sympathetic override. So it can really slow down your digestive tract. Your body's really gonna only digest things when you're not in stress, stress mode, right? Psychological disturbances, so that can be anything from anger to, um, you know, just think of any psychological, mental thing that can can trigger you, can cause constipation. Okay. Chronic constipation can cause hemorrhoids, which are, um, I shouldn't say just because they can be wicked. Um, these are blood vessels that dilate and rupture. Uh, you can have internal hemorrhoids and they kind of push through the surface. You can have external hemorrhoids, which you can see from the from um, the outside with with a mirror, obviously. You can't see it on yourself. All right, so hemorrhoids, just realize they're really common, especially um, women who are pregnant um, or if you're constipating, you really have to constipate and this rectum fills up with a very large fecal matter and you have to um, expel it. it takes a lot of pressure and you have to really open that internal and external rectum larger than we um, normally do all that pressure can can um, cause that uh, vein or capillary to burst all right or at least uh rupture diverticula are um in your small intestine you have little pockets from not eating a lot of fiber or having slow transit time. So the, the tube in your small intestine will find the weakest area and it'll just kind of bubble out. So there's a diverticula. Diverticulite is, is inflammation of this area. <clears throat> Diarrhea, we've all probably experienced that. Symptoms, causes can be um, illness. Generally diarrhea, um, I find to be healthy, um, it's inconvenient, but your body is just saying abort mission. Whatever it ate, it says, get it out. So you just wanna flush it out. So if it's bacteria, poisons, endotoxins, um, yeah, I'm gonna get into the microbiology of it, but yeah, anything that could be detrimental, your body will just say, you know what? It just speeds up the transit time. Usually it's 30 to 40 hours from food from the time you eat it to the time you expel it. Diarrhea, it will say, you know what? 
I want it out in an hour. You know, you to drink a lot of fluid, you'll just flush it out. And we don't have time to take the fluid out in order to test it, so it's generally more uh, aqueous. Severe diarrhea, especially in the elderly or infants, can cause dehydration because you have to increase that transit time and to make it aqueous, we have to take fluid out of the capillary beds um, and put it into the digestive tract. And we don't replenish that through drinking. We can be uh, dehydrated and cause nutrient loss because we're expelling any nutrients from the large or small intestine out. And treatment can be um, just eating whatever you can, bread, salty, and crackers, Pepto-Bismol, um, some of these other treatments. Now, vomiting. People say, I vomited, I'm sick. I'm going to say, no, you vomited because you're healthy. Your body knew enough to say, you know what, whatever's in my stomach is not good. I don't want to go through my digestive tract. I want to throw it up. So your body will expel it. Right. <clears throat> Severe cases, repeated vomiting can cause problem with the esophagus because your stomach, once again, is very acidic. It has a pH of two to four, depending on who you're talking to. So it's very acidic and repeated vomiting can start eroding the esophagus. You can get Barrett's esophagus or metaplasia. <clears throat> Concurrent diarrhea, so you can have vomiting and diarrhea. If you have the, I've never had the flu. I don't ever want it, but from what I've heard, uh, these are E. coli, by the way. So by the pink blood food. Acid reflux, some of you probably have that. So your stomach, you have so much acid or you're belching that it goes to that um, esophageal area into the diaphragm, and that's where you can get stomach contents go up into your throat. Not good. And heartburn is really similar to this. So we can have that um, just a lot of gastric upset from eating fatty, greasy food. Ketchup, which is high in sugar, mustard, vinegar is big, is acidic. Tomato-based sauces uh, cause a lot of heartburn. Carbonated beverages can cause you to belch and have a lot of heartburn. Peppermint, coffee, some people, and chocolate. So just be aware of some of the foods you eat can um, make you more prone to heartburn. And GERD, I mentioned before, gastroesophageal reflux. So mouth, esophagus, stomach. So reflux is when it goes the wrong way. It's called GERD. So frequent acid reflux, nausea, gagging, chronic cough, and hoarse throat from that stomach acid coming up through the um, cardiac sphincter and into the esophagus. Risk reduction. So how can we slow it down? And acids, not a big fan of that. Um, I'll get into the details of that. Lose excess weight, because if you're, if you're heavy or have excess weight, Especially when you lay down, all that weight pushes down and then it pushes up into your diaphragm and your stomach causes that reflux. So any excess weight you have pushes into your intestines and if you're laying down, pushes down and then up, causes uh, extra pressure on the stomach. Do not lay down following a meal. Do not agree, avoid smoking, even vaping, prolonged use. I'm not even touching this. <clears throat> Avoid problematic foods. All right. So for some people, it can be for me, it is tomato-based sauces before bed. Nightmare. Terrible. So it can be coffee, it can be spicy um, foods, hot sauce. You know, it varies per person. But something that's going to irritate the stomach can cause an increase in that. And then once again, you can have, if the stomach, the acid goes into your esophagus, you can cause ulcers, esophageal cancer. I mentioned Barrett's esophagus or metaplasia. <clears throat> Barrett's esophagus is a condition. Metaplasia is precancerous. Right. Now, peptic ulcers, so that means stomach. Right. This is when the stomach acid starts eating through the lining of your stomach, through that mucous membrane. Burning pain in the upper abdomen, vomiting fresh blood, which would be red. <clears throat> now, black tarry stool. So what happens with that? 
um, I won't get into the occult or whatever, but black tarry stools is as that blood goes through your digestive tract and starts digesting it. <clears throat> so when you go to excrete it, it's black. It's very tarry, um, not to grow up, but kind of looks like a Tootsie Roll. All right. An increased risk can be H. pylori infection. So peptic ulcers are not really from stress or alcohol. They're actually from a bacteria called uh, H. pylori, and it can actually live in your stomach due to the stomach acid. Most It'll inhibit most bacteria, but H. pylori can live there. Um, Heliobacter pylori, uh, it's found in 80% of cases. Excess stomach acid, smoking, alcohol consumption is huge in this. Right. And alcohol, by the way, alcohol and aspirin are the only two things that can be uh, absorbed directly from the stomach. Prolonged use of NSAIDs, non steroid anti inflammatory medications. And then family history is a factor. Gallstones are extremely painful. Right. Those usually, gallstones, um, are painful as they get jammed up into that um, <clears throat> the tube that drains the gallbladder into the adenum. Okay. But generally, um, when I was in <clears throat> grad school, it was 40 female fertile, which means you have a lot of children and overweight. Those were the four keys. But what will happen is after a fatty meal, like a milkshake, french fries, something very fatty, your body's going to trigger the gallbladder to contract because you're putting fat into the duodenum. And I said before, gall, the gallbladder will help emulsify fat to break it down to help uh, the smaller the particles, the more surface area and the large intestines. But constantly doing that, um, sometimes it'll back up. You can have um, gallstones. And I'm not sure they look like a bunch of, it's called bag of diamonds, but we will get into that. It will bowel syndrome, right? That can be caused um, by poor food choices, uh, increasingly prevalent since the 70s. Um, I, my speculation is it has to do a lot with, um, <clears throat> to be careful what I say, but a lot of with the food supply or the chemicals. And, um, my opinion caused. Uh, that so you can look up that on your own if you want, but a lot of people that have it, um, all it just the onset will be all of a sudden they'll have to leave a social event or they'll have to go run to the bathroom real quick. So, really, your balls are really irritable. So, something's affecting it. It can be pesticides, it can be chemicals, dye, red dye, and food, you know, just to name a few. <clears throat> Ulcerative colitis. So Colon is the large intestine, the last portion. Ulcerative means it's ulcerated, so it's, it's bleeding. It got through that first layer. Right? So ulcerative colitis usually is bloody, and that stool will be reddish. It's called frank blood because it's the lower or the last part of the GI tract. So that blood usually is excreted out. So that's generally a symptom too with that. And colorectal cancer. Please realize um, cancer is any cell that's going through my pack division ultimately quick. And every time your cells divide, there's always a chance that it can be erroneous. So generally you have to have um, an error or two through my pack division and you have to have some oncogenes or something that would trigger it. So it can be pesticides in the food or something chemical, a cancer causing in the food. Mix that with the cells, and generally you can have setting yourself up for some cancers or for some problems. Um, you can check that out with a colonoscopy. But signs and symptoms would be diarrhea, constipation, nausea, vomiting. Feeling the bowel is never empty. So you go to the bathroom and you say, I'm not quite sure I'm done. Blood in stools is huge, it's bleeding. All right, stools are very narrow. So um, it can be ribbon or pencil like, right? So that's generally not a good thing. And, you know, once in a blue moon, it, it, it's normal, I guess, depending on what you're eating or not eating. But if it's over consistently over time, not a good thing. 
frequent gas pains, cramps and bloating, loss of weight without trying. That's a key red sign for cancer. Uh, pain that wakes you up at night or cachexia or losing weight without even trying because as the cancer cells are dividing, they're using a lot of your nutrients. So they're dividing without any inhibition, really draining your, your resources. So you will always lose weight. You're tired all the time because you're just fatigued. The metabolic rate is speeding up in these areas. It's making the cancer cells. <clears throat> so colorectal cancer, you know, some of these stats are old, but age, colorectal polyps, all right, so anyone over 40 or 50, it used to be 50, but I'm going to say, in my opinion, I have all my patients get it done early. Uh, usually more prevalent in males and females, but I would say now with the food supply and our eating habits, um, never too early, say 30, 40, have it done. Family history, if you have a parent that has it, definitely want to take them checked out. Any personal history of cancer, because cancer can spread metastasize from anywhere. Um, always, always thought any kind of irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, certain foods, smoking, chemical intake, whether it is through pesticides or petroleum products or anything that's going through your skin, definitely get that checked out. And colorectal cancer is common because your intestinal tract, your, any epithelium is constantly dividing, replenishing, because as things go through your intestines, they're sloughing off all those cells, which is good, but they have to be replenished. So the mitotic division of your digestive tract is constant. So there's always a chance of having cancer in there. All right, I'll end the video here. We'll pick that up a little bit because I think I talked for about an hour or so.